Heather is a member of the Ontario Bat Network Organizing Committee and she has been a biologist with Natural Resources Solutions Incorporated uh, for uh, more than uh, 10 years now. And her uh, presentation uh, this morning is going to be on uh, Southern Ontario bat capture rates and Northern Myotis roost tree selection. Welcome. Hi everyone, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about some of our preliminary results from the first year of a two-year study um, focused on trying to learn more about the distribution and characteristics of maternity habitats of our tree roosting species at risk bats in southern Ontario. As you might have guessed, um, our target species are northern myotis, tricolor bat, and little brown myotis. So just to take a quick step back, oh. um, what do we know about maternity habitat in southern Ontario? And I'm talking about maternity habitats in natural habitats. Um, not in anthropogenic structures. Um, well, as most of you know, we know very little about where these maternity habitats occur in southern Ontario for these three species. Um, for example, this is a map from the Provincial Recovery Strategy showing the occurrence of northern myotis across the province. We know of one maternity site um, for this species that occurs in natural habitats. Tricolor bat, we don't know any maternity sites in the province. And last but not least, for little brown myotis, um, we know quite a few um, associated with buildings, but we only know of one maternity site in a natural habitat. Or at least, I am, I'm only aware of one. <laughs> So why are there so few maternity sites known in natural habitats for these species? Well, it all comes down to how hard they are to study or how challenging they are. Um, it can be difficult to access natural areas and the effort required to identify these habitat types can add up, um, can be quite costly. Historically, we've focused on easy to access sites such as buildings, and um, sites where there are high concentrations of individuals, such as overwintering sites in mines or caves. Um, we have acoustic surveys now, which are becoming more and more available and easier to conduct. Um, but we really only have data from these for, from the last several years. And acoustic surveys can be great at identifying candidate habitats, but we really need to conduct capture to confirm bat species ID and telemetry to find out exactly where they're roosting and if they're using the habitat. Um, currently in Ontario, um, neither telemetry nor capture is required as part of impact analyses um, for proposed developments. This is potentially a lost opportunity for us to learn more about these habitats. So what have we been up to for the last year and how are we trying to address this general lack of knowledge surrounding maternity habitats in natural habitats. Um, well, in collaboration with Landcare Niagara, last year we selected four primary sites to conduct mist net captures at. Each of these sites were forested habitats and um, illustrated here actually with the yellow stars. We conducted five to seven nights of capture surveys at each of these primary sites um, during the peak maternity period last year. And we also managed to squeeze in a couple extra nights of surveys at two additional, two additional sites. This table here just um, provides a little bit more detail with regards to our survey effort at each of these sites. Our primary sites were located in Haldimand, Hamilton, Norfolk County site number one, and Waterloo Region site number one. 
So what did we find? Um, we captured six species across all of our sites, the majority of which were big brown bat, as you can see in the pie chart on the right. Um, we also captured small numbers of eastern red and silver-haired bat, little brown, eastern small-footed myotis, and northern myotis. Um, the sites with the highest number of captures were our Hamilton and Norfolk County site number one primary sites. When we look at the capture rates at each of our primary sites, you'll notice that they are relatively small. I don't know if you can see the scale on the bottom of that, but it ranges from zero to 0 0.6 captures per net hour. We were fortunate to receive some data um, from a, a study that was completed in the 80s um, in order to be able to compare our capture rates to pre-white nose syndrome ca capture rates. Um, the study conducted capture surveys at um, or within the same forested habitats as the capture surveys that we conducted um, at our Norfolk and Haldeman sites. So looking at the data, um, the 1985 study is across the top. Um, you'll note that their capture rates are a little higher than what we um, observed last year. And what sticks out to me is that purple bar and that orange bar, um, which are the capture rates for little brown myotis and northern myotis. Um, and you also note at the end there, um, the navy blue, which is tricolored bat. So how does this translate to survey effort that might be required to capture and study our species at risk bats currently, at least at our sites? Um, in 1985, they would have thrown up four single highs, single high nets, um, and within less than an hour, they were capturing little brown myotis. Um, and just over an hour, they would have been capturing northern myotis. Um, when you look at our data from last year, um, it took us 11 nights of surveys before we captured our first little brown, and 21 nights before we captured um, a northern myotis. But were we ever excited to capture that northern myotis? <laughs> um, we captured her at our Hamilton primary site. Um, and um, the icing on the cake was that she was a pregnant female. Meaning? <laughs> um, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> Um, we, so, we attached a transmitter to her, released her um, after tagging her, and tracked her during the day, daytime. Um, her retention, tag retention time was five days. Um, and we tracked her for four of those days um, to four separate roosts. Canada Day did get in there. Um, and we were excited um, to identify the second maternity habitat in Ontario in a natural setting um, that we're aware of. Um, so some of the roofs that we tracked her to um, were pretty interesting. Um, the first one we tracked her to was a sugar maple um, with a diameter at breast height of 35 centimeters. Um, the roost height is circled in orange there um, and was 1.6 meters above the ground level. The second roost that we tracked her to was a slightly smaller tree, an American beech, um, with a diameter at breast height of 16 centimeters. The roost height was 1.5 meters above ground level. And this one, um, the third roost that we tracked her to was even smaller, um, at six centimeters dBH, and she was only roosting um, 0.46 meters above ground level. 
The last one that we tracked her to was, again, a much larger snag, a white ash, um, with a 46 centimeter diameter at breast height. Um, and we couldn't see any obvious cavity or crevice on this tree, but there was a lot of sloughing bark. So we're assuming that she was roosting under some of that loose bark at the top there. We estimated um, the height of the roost with the use of a clinometer to be about 13.5 meters high. Lots of sun exposure up there. So in summary, um, pre-white nose syndrome capture surveys were very effective at capturing our species at risk bats. Um, and we can't protect habitat if we don't know where it is or what it looks like. Um, and I think the first step would be to find where they're roosting in southern Ontario. Um, so we have one more year of funding and we have a lot of work cut out for us, or we have our work cut out for us this year. I'd just like to say thanks to everyone that has supported this project so far. Um, the project was funded by the Provincial Species at Risk Stewardship Program, and we've been working really close with Landcare Niagara to complete all of our field work. Um, oh, and a special thanks to our very dedicated co-op student who isn't here today, but um, we wouldn't have been able to do this without her. Thanks. So the first question was, um, can you remind me how, what the height was um, from the shortest height from the ground? Um, and it was, I think around 0 0.5, yeah, 0 0.46 centimeters um, above ground level. Oh, sorry, meters. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty, uh, yeah, um, meters. And the second question um, was whether or not we knew there was more than one bat roosting in some of these roost sites. Um, unfortunately, we didn't con conduct an emergence survey until, what was it, like a week after? Um, about a week after, we, she dropped her tag, so she was no longer roosting. Well, we don't know if she was roosting in any of these trees, and no, everyone that helped us conduct the emergence surveys, we did them all on one night um, at all of the roost trees we identified, and no one had any bats emerging. It was, it was while we thought it still had the tag, but we weren't able to find it that day. So it was probably the first day it had dropped the tag. Oh, uh, okay. That's right. Okay. So we weren't sure if she still had her tag or not. Um, so we did conduct it. Um, pretty close to tagging the bat. Um, sure. Um, I'm curious how you determine the location of your netting sites. Were they already like through did you acoustics first to find out if there were bats certain species in the area, or was it just looking at appropriate habitat to set up nets? So the question was, how did we determine where to set up our nets? Um, the plan, the original plan. Um, was that we would conduct acoustic surveys first, um, but our funding came in a little late, um, so we just jumped right into netting in our first year. Um, and we selected our sites based on, um, well, there were a bunch of, a bunch of factors, but um, we tried to um, select like ponds or wetlands that we can net over where they knew they would um, come to drink. Um, we netted along trails in forested habitat. Um, we also netted in the exact 
um, at one spot in the exact location where they netted during the 1985 study. Um, one of our volunteers had, net, had helped with those surveys. Um, what else did we use? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. um, we based, just to repeat that, um, we based our selection of sites on um, habitat and previous studies. We didn't do swabs, but we looked for evidence. Um, and I can't remember if the Northern had evidence of white nose. No, no, it didn't have any evidence of white nose, but we didn't conduct a swab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll let you explain that. <laughs> we, didn't, we don't really do swabs in the summer because we wouldn't really expect to detect the fungus very much because it doesn't really grow in temperatures over like 20 degrees Celsius. So um, yeah, we don't put effort into doing that and running those tests because um, I think Liam's done a lot of that work. <laughs> they usually don't really have much fungal load in the summer, right? It, it usually clears up and then they get reinfected in the winter. Thanks, Christy. Is there still time? Okay. Sure. Some of the some of the literature on like roost locations for certain kind of mitosis um, pegs them on kind of like higher features further up trees, maybe larger diameter trees. Um, do you have any sense for um, is this just more of like an unknown kind of feature, or whether this was I guess what I'll call like contingency roosting, like the area that you were looking at didn't have the big trees with the high up features that would be ideal, and so they were kind of finding what was Um, so the question was, um, maybe if I reword it a bit and you can correct me, um, was there larger diameter trees in the forested habitat where we were tracking the northern um, that were available for roosting, um, but she, we were finding her using these smaller diameter trees. Um, and there, this was um, a mature forest. Um, so there were larger diameter trees um, available. Uh, it, um, yeah. Well, if you didn't hear that, Christy said that it was an old growth forest. We have time for one more question. Um, sorry, I keep. I need to go to you because you keep putting your hand up, and I. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, of the four roosting, um, how far apart were they? Like, how far would you say they were from each other? Like, were they like right next to each other? Like, were they like on the same spot? And then also, sorry if I missed it, but was, were some of those roosts used for multiple nights? Um, we don't know if they were used for multiple nights. Um, we missed one day um, of tracking during those five days that she retained her tag for, and every day that we tracked her, um, she moved to a different roost. Um, oh, and um, there's the, the distance between her capture site and one of the roost sites that we um, tracked her to was 380 meters. Um, I can't remember the distance between the other ones offhand. Less than 380 yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess that was one more question. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>